My uh, personal homepage is valerio written as va.ler.io. You will find a copy of this presentation with uh, interesting links to all the things I will uh, talk about today. My email address is valerio written as v.ler.io. And uh, my Twitter handle is Valerio. I am, being a nerd, I am quite proud of these uh, addresses. Uh, what we'll talk about today, a short introduction, uh, and then the process of reverse engineering, starting with information gathering, building an emulation environment to run interesting binaries using KEMU, analyze how the device works, and then uh, in, a, in a DOM router example, modify the kernel. To define what reverse engineering is, we have to define what engineering is. In the just a couple of words, we can say that engineering is the science of making things that start with product requirements, design the product, and then build or manufacture the product. The reverse engineering process is exactly the same process, but done in reverse order. So we start from the finished product that is manufactured by someone else, analyze the product, we take measurements, reconstruct the design, and understand what the requirements were. But uh, a really important uh, concept is that usually we are not interested in, uh, in all the details of the product, but only on a part of it. For example, in the home router example, I was only interested in uh, modifying the router firmware to add some missing features. You can also uh, can be interested in other aspects. For example, if you have an IoT device controlling a production machine and you want to replace that device to do something more, maybe you are interested to reverse engineer the protocol used to exchange information between the controlling uh, device and production machine. Uh, information gathering starts with knowing who manufactured the product. In the home router example, uh, it was manufactured by the link but also you have to know uh, who is the original design manufacturer because sometimes a company manufactures the product but another one has done the design and the development. In this case, for example, a Swiss company called ADB was, uh, did the design of this router. You open the case, identify main device components, and uh, you have to locate the UART, the serial interface, and possible also the JTAG interface. The serial console interface is very, very important. And then you have to, in some way, to get the firmware and the root file system. In this example, I opened the case, and it was quite easy to locate the serial console because it is clearly uh, marked, oh, sorry, it is clearly, uh, clearly marked in, uh, in the PCB. But other uh, device, for example, the system on a chip, was much harder to understand uh, where it is. In this case, I didn't found it because probably it is hidden below that sheet of metal. Anyway, general concept is try to get as much information as you can, but to move forward, and uh, will, you will return back only if some missing information is absolutely needed. Uh, the first thing to locate is the serial console. It is really useful to locate. So first of all, you will search on the internet to see if some, someone else has already done the job for you. Otherwise, you have to identify potential serial either's candidates. Uh, usually, sometimes they are marked on the PCB, as in our case. Uh, if they are not marked on the PCB, you usually look for four pins, VCC ground, TX, and RX. You can use a multimeter to find potential candidates because VCC and ground are easy to find. Uh, RX usually is a pull-up resistor, so you can uh, identify. You can also, if you have identified the system on a chip on the printed circuit board, and if you have the pinout of the system on a chip, you can identify the serial console on the pinout of the chip and try to follow PCB traces. It can be difficult because in a multi-layer board it's not easy to follow traces on the PCB. You can also use tools like JTagulator. JTagulator is a nice tool with about 20 uh, pin headers that you can connect to potential candidates and start an automatic scan and it is able to identify uh, serial console and also the JDAG interface. You can also use an oscilloscope or logic analyzer to locate the TX pin that for sure will move during the boot 
between VCC and ground uh, multiple times. Uh, it is also interesting to locate the, where the JDAG interface is. Uh, JDAG is uh, an inducive standard for testing printed circuit boards after manufacture. Uh, in our case, we are interested because it allows to read and write uh, flash memory contents and can also be used as a primary means for uh, any circuit emulator. So it basically allows to run the GNU debugger on the real hardware. Uh, if we have uh, multiple devices with the JDAG interface on the board, these devices are usually <coughs> daisy-chained together. Uh, the JDAG interface uh, usually has four or five pins. Uh, the four pins are the clock, data in, data out, and test mode select. Uh, you can also have a, a reset pin. This is uh, optional because the JDAG interface can be resetted using also the other pins. To locate the JDAG interface is not easy because there is no uh, standard pinout, but anyway, there are few popular pinout, and uh, on the tour, you will find uh, many of the possible uh, pinouts. So, as always, the first step we search on the internet to see if someone else has already done the job for us. Otherwise, we uh, try to find some labels on the printed circuit board to identify the JDAG interface. If this fails, uh, we have to look for uh, a single row or five or six pin or for a double row or 10, 14, and 20 pin headers. Uh, we start looking at the ground of UCC with the multimeter on the potential candidate. Uh, we know also that usually there are pull-ups on the TMS at TDI pin. So basically, with the, the multimeter, we can identify potential candidates and we can compare what we have found with the popular pinouts. And if we are lucky, we, in this way, we have identified all the JTAC interface pin. You can also try to follow this, the, these pins on the system on a chip, knowing the, the pinout, the following PCB trace. On, or also, we can use the JTAGulator tool, as I talked about, that does some automatic scan and usually is able to, uh, to find the JTAG interface. Once we have identified uh, this interface, we have to repopulate them. This means to attach headers to connect our uh, interface. So we need uh, a desoldering pump and a soldering iron to do, to do so. The, we are really interested, especially in the serial uh, console, because it allows us to, what, to watch what it is printed on the serial console during the boot cycle. This usually allows to identify the bootloader and the uh, operating system version. In our case, that I want to modify the, the firmware, also watching the firmware upgrade cycle, it's quite interesting. We have to connect a USB TTL serial adapter to the serial console and to the PC using a terminal emulator. A very popular terminal emulator is PuTTY that is available on PC, Mac, and uh, Linux. <coughs> we are interested also in the JDAG interface because it allows us to read the firmware out of the flash EPROM and also be able to break, allows us to be able to break into the boot cycle and use JDAG as a means to do in circuit debugging. Uh, to do so, we needed to attach an interface to the JDAG. One uh, popular interface, especially for hobbyists, is uh, bus pirate. Uh, and also, we have to use a software. There is a very nice open source software. It is called Open OCD that allows to dump flash EPROM and to do in circuit debugging. Anyway, these operations are quite complicated, but on the internet, you will find a lot of documentation on how to do it. Because uh, we have always tried to do things as fast as possible, we always uh, follow the easiest path first. This means that if the supplier has a website with the firmware updates, we don't get the firmware from the JDAG interface, but we go to the supplier website and uh, download the firmware. Sometimes the firmware update can be done directly only by the device itself. In this case, uh, we can sniff the communication with the Wireshark and get the firmware file. If the above steps are not available, we have to download the EPROM image through the JTAG connector using bus pirate and open OCD. Once you have the firmware file, you have to analyze it. In this case, I downloaded from the supplier website, 
and th there is a fantastic piece of software that is called Binwalk. Binwalk analyzes a binary file trying to find signatures for popular file systems and other uh, structured data. In this case, uh, Binwalk found a, ju a journaling flash file system uh, and at the offset 200 hexadecimal and also a piece of gzipped compressed data. Binwalk also has the minus C option to extract what it has found inside the firmware file. In this case, it extracted the gzipped compressed data, the boot root file system image, and was also able to extract the file system image into a folder. The first file uh, is a tar archive that contains some packages for different type of boards. And the extracted file system, it seems that we have three file systems, but in reality we have, we have only two. This was related to a small problem with the extraction, with the extraction program. But we are able to see that on the boot file system, we have the bootloader, that is a CFE, Common Firmware Environment, that is a bootloader made by Broadcom and given to his uh, customers, and also the, the kernel. The kernel is uh, in an unusual format, is uh, compressed, but is in a format that is used by CFE to load it and decompress it uh, to load into the memory. Looking at the file system, we can identify that it is a file system based on uh, BCBox and also the version of BCBox using Redelf and also looking at uh, library files. We are able to identify that it is a MuSilibc, that version uh, based firmware, and also we are able to identify other libraries and uh, related versions. Then, uh, after doing this preliminary analysis on the hardware and on the file system, we can power up the, the board, connect the serial console to a terminal emulator, and start looking at what is printed during the boot cycle. In uh, this case, we were looking at what is printed. We were able to identify the bootloader version, the CPID, the fact that the processor is an ARM v7, Cortex A9 dual core running at 1 gigahertz, and also that it runs this version of Linux 3.4.11 with real time patch 19. And also that we have a JFF2 file system with, among other things, LZMA compression uh, that is not part of the standard kernel but is added with the patch. Uh, we also are able to understand how the flash EPROM is. Uh, partitioned, and that the init program that starts is the BCBox program that follows what is defined in the etch init tab configuration file. Among other things, we are also able to spot this string during the boot cycle, and this string searching on the internet shows the original design manufacturer, that it is ADB, it is a Swiss company. So this company was the company that designed uh, the router and built the software. So basically, analyzing the file system and what is printed on the serial console, we were able to identify uh, the, the processor, the NAND, Linux version, Musilib version, BusyBox version, and all other related library versions. One interesting thing is that this router started shipping in Italy uh, at the beginning of this year, I think April of this year. But the software it is built on is very quite old because the kernel is from 2012 and other components are also older. This is because of what Lady uh, Corbett told us this morning. Uh, if we want to reverse engineer this router, maybe we want to analyze some binary, to execute some binary in an emulation environment. To do so, we use uh, KEMU, that is uh, an emulator that is able to emulate a lot of different CPU and different uh, boards. So we choose, this, uh, we, we choose the VXPress A9 board that supports the Cortex A9 CPU and allows us to run uh, binaries. But we not only need 
an emulator, we also need uh, a kernel, a library files, and a root file system. So we have to build a root file system to emulate interesting binaries into, uh, in the kernel. Uh, we, have, we can choose one of the most popular open source building system. The most popular is, for sure, the Octo project. It is very powerful, builds uh, a root file system, and creates also a custom Linux distribution, including a package manager into the root file systems. But if you don't know the Octo project, its main drawback is that it has a steep learning curve. Another popular choice is uh, build root. Uh, build root is uh, simpler. It builds only the kernel and the root file system, but it is much easier and fast to learn, and also has a very good user manual that is not too long, but also not too short. Another popular choice is to use OpenWRT. That is the build system used by the OpenWRT project. It is tailored to build a replacement router firmware but the documentation uh, is scattered in the website and requires more time to learn than, uh, than build the root. For this reason, uh, I choose build the root for uh, this project. But to choose build the root is not enough because you want to emulate as much as possible the real hardware, so you have to use uh, the same Musilib C version, uh, possible same or compatible library version uh, of other libraries, and also uh, that, uh, that kernel version. The latest version of build root is not good because it doesn't ship with the Musilib C, that older version, but with the Musilib C new generation that is not fully compatible with that version. So we have to use an older version of build root. In this case, build root 2.0.14. Uh, but the problem is that if you use an older version of build root, it doesn't run on a, a newer version of, uh, of Linux. So for this uh, reason, uh, it is needed to run it on an older version of Linux, for example, on Debian Wizzy that was released in 2013. To do so, the easiest thing to do is to use a Docker container uh, instead of a virtualized environment because it is faster, for sure, faster to use. The Docker, to build the Docker container, we start from a basic Debian Wizzy and we add only what is needed to run build the root. And then we can run with the script the Docker container just three uh, important points. Uh, one is that uh, we map the X11 temporary directory from the host system inside the Docker machine. This allows to run X Windows application inside the Docker machine and have the Windows displayed on the host machine. This is mainly used to do a make X config on the uh, on the build root system. Uh, we can also map the entire home directory from the host machine inside the Docker container. In this way, we can easily share all the files that are needed. And we also pass the username, user ID, the group membership, and so on, to have the same user with the same username and same user ID inside the Docker machine, so everything is uh, transparent. So basically, we can uh, run on top on Linux, and we have another uh, X terminal window uh, below running in the Docker container, uh, but we share exactly the same home directory, same user ID, uh, same username, so it's almost transparent. Uh, we have to, to build the root file system. We have to configure the, the <coughs> uh, to configure uh, the build root system. We do a very simple configuration, we start with the, the vExpress configuration included in the build root system, and we build packages and libraries with the debugging, debugging symbols. We don't strip binaries and uh, we don't do any GCC optimization because we want to uh, run interesting binaries in this emulated environment and be able to put breakpoint on the library function calls. Uh, so we also build uh, related debugging uh, software on the root file system like uh, GDB, GDP server, and so on. And we also include uh, drivers for flash file system and GFFS2 file system. And also we include some libraries that we are interested in to run interesting binaries in, uh, in, in binaries taken from the router. Kernel, min very minor configuration, just we select the, the platform that we are emulating. We select a preemptible kernel because this is the one running on the router, and we select NAND 
device support and support for NAND flash simulator. And obviously, we included the JFFS2 file system. MUSILIBC configuration, just a minor configuration to be compatible with the, the MUSILIBC configuration that is in, uh, in the router. And also, we included the bugging symbols. Sorry, I, I go quite fast, but uh, the time is short, so. Uh, then we have, after we have built our emulation environment, we start analyzing what the router does. In this case, I was interesting, interested in modifying the firmware, so basic idea was to look at the firmware upgrade procedure to see if we can uh, modify the firmware using the upgrade uh, procedure. Uh, so I, I started the upgrade procedure using the web interface and started looking at what is printed on the serial console. In this way, it was possible to understand that the first step is to run the script upgrade prepare that simply kills some process not needed during the upgrades. And then there is the upgrade uh, process. Uh, the upgrade process, the first thing that it does, it checks the signature of the firmware file. Uh, then erase one of the partition of the flash EPROM, the partition dedicated to the upgrade, and then using DD extract the boot and root file system and using an end write, write this uh, boot and root file system onto the device. But looking at what is written on the serial console, we understand exactly where the boot and root file system is on the firmware file. Then at the end of the upgrade, it adds some uh, additional packages and then rewrite the bootloader. So basically the interesting script to analyze is the upgrade.sh script. And in particular, we are interested in the SIG verify that is a binary in the router that check uh, the signature of the firmware file. Because the idea is to make a firmware file maybe with the fake signature so that we can load what we want instead of the standard firmware file. Uh, SIG Verify, as other binaries in the router, is a, a stripped binary, so you will not find any symbol, but it calls library functions. Using uh, readelf, we can list all the binary functions that this binary uh, calls. And the idea is that we run this binary in the emulated environment using uh, GDB, so GDB server in the, in the emulated environment, a GDB in the host machine, we can put a breakpoint on each library calls, so we cannot debug, I would say, the binary itself, but we, we can understand every library calls that it does. During this analysis, it is possible to clearly understand what this uh, script does. Basically, it reads the last 256 bytes from the file, that it is the signature. It uh, calculates the SH1 checksum of the firmware file without the signatures. And then it calls libgcrypt functions to uh, check the signature. So it used the SH1 message digest, the signature, the last 256 bytes from the file, and the public key. The public key is embedded inside this script, and so in this way it checks the signature. So the firmware file has been signed with the private key, and the public key is included in the, in the script. The public key is basically formed by two multi-precision integers, so called modulus and exponent. These two uh, multi-precision integers are inside the binary and can also be extracted for, from memory using GDB and reconstruct the public key in the standard uh, PEM format. But unfortunately, the private key uh, remains unknown it's, and it's not included in the router's uh, certificates. So we have to find another route to, to modify the, the firmware file. Analyzing the, the router and the initialization scripts, uh, the router has a telnet interface uh, with the restricted shell. The restricted shell has a Cisco-like interface. Cisco-like means that if you type help, you have a list of all the commands available. And if you start typing something and press tab, the command is auto-completed and the possible options are shown. Uh, 
investigating on uh, the router file system, it is possible to find that this restricted shell is an open source project called the Clish, and it is configured to using XML files. There are two XML files, one for the so-called normal mode and one for the so-called uh, factory mode. Analyzing this XML file is possible to discover that there is an hidden command that is called factory mode. Hidden means that it is not shown uh, typing help and it is not auto-completed pressing tab. Uh, but in, in this mode it's possible, using factory mode command, it is possible to enter in this factory mode. But it's uh, not an interesting mode because Wi-Fi will not function, uh, internet will not function, the HTTP server is not running, but it allows to, uh, to have a normal shell, a busy box shell. There is a command system shell that gives a busy box shell with a non-privileged user. So you cannot do anything, but you can look around. So uh, now the task is to escalate privileges to become uh, a root. So the first thing to do that uh, I did was to look at all the processes running as a root on the system, uh, trying to identify each process running as a root using uh, strings to look at the strings inside the process, and also maybe executing the process in the emulation environment using uh, minus view, minus h options to understand what kind of uh, software it is. Then you can fa identify open source executables and search on, in on the internet for known, for known vulnerabilities. Uh, and you also have to check that these vulnerabilities are exploitable in the specific IoT device configuration because often you find vulnerabilities that are exploitable only under some uh, certain configuration. In this case, I didn't find anything on this, but if you have no exploitable vulnerabilities, you have to select some process to reverse engineer in the emulation environment uh, to find some vulnerabilities. Usually, operating system binaries with no known vulnerabilities on the internet are difficult to, to crack because no one else has already done. Uh, usually lower level binaries like uh, DNS uh, specific or voice specific, uh, I would say router specific are more difficult to crack because they do a very specific task and, uh, and uh, have usually a smaller attack surface. Higher level executables with bigger configuration files usually are more easy to, to crack. In this way, analyzing the router, the router basically is a process called CM for configuration manager that does all the router configurations. So it had the users configure the HCP servers, ATP address, and so on, and it runs as a root user. And then there is, a, and also it uses script, shell script to carry out its duties. And then there is a companion process called CM client that runs as a normal user, and it is used by the, uh, by the interface, the, the telnet interface and by the web interface. Basically, this CM client running as a normal user asks to the CM process to make configuration change. Like, for example, if on the router I change the router IP, CM client command asks to CM to change this uh, uh, this IP. But an interesting thing, analyzing startup script, is that CM client is used, has been used during startup script also to configure the CM process. So basically, making a, a long uh, story short, uh, it is uh, CM client is, is used in startup script to configure CM process using uh, XML files, where in XML files there is the script that you have to use to do certain tasks, a normal shell script. So the idea is we can copy this configuration file in a temporary directory as a normal user. We can uh, change the script to our own script that uh, basically will, when, we, when we will be run, will be run as user root. And do, for example, we can change the edge password file to remove the password for root. In this way, we can then trigger the execution of this script, and we can uh, become a root. When we, we are root, basically we can do uh, theoretically everything. But the problem, uh, <coughs> the problem is always to have the firmware file to load into the system. 
we know exactly, analyzing the upgrade script, we know exactly when the root, where the root file system is. So the idea is extract the root file system, create the new root, modify it, create the new root file system image. If it is a new root file system image, the same size as the original uh, root file system image, because we don't know every field in the firmware file, but so just replacing something with something at the same size should not create a problem. Reassemble everything using the DD command, and so we have created an unsigned firmware file. The problem, the problem is how to load this unsigned firmware file. Uh, analyzing the upgrade script, we have seen that the SIG verify script has been used, and uh, there is a, a function call that calls the SIG verify script and then return the code of the SIG verify. We can copy this script in a temporary directory, change just one line of code, so we always return it true, also if the signature fails, and then we can temporarily replace the, this script with the, the one we have created in the temporary directory using the mount minus minus bind. Uh, bound with these options allows not only to mount a folder as usually it is used, but also to mount a single file. In this way, we can do the upgrade using the web interface, and the upgrade uh, goes well, and our firmware, modified firmware, will be loaded into the router. Uh, so we have reached our uh, scope. So <coughs> summary, reverse engineering can be really, really challenging. It is uh, important to clearly define the limited scope of the project, uh, to know how to move forward and uh, when to, to stop and to maybe to declare victory. Uh, it is important to start gathering information, always following the easiest path first. So if some information is missing or difficult to get, move forward. Uh, you will go back only if absolutely needed. Always search on the internet for everything. Uh, including known vulnerabilities. And uh, uh, when you have to select some process to act, select process running as a root and that have a large attack surface, as uh, we did. Uh, if you download this presentation, there are some useful links. Uh, uh, two links, uh, two important links. One is the tools that I wrote and that, and that are available on, GitHub, on my own GitHub to hack this router. The other one is a set of script and configuration file to build the um, emulation environment. So we have a few minutes for uh, questions. What happened in case of encrypted file system? Sorry? The, basically, I see that the, the, the file system wall was only signed, but not yes. encrypted. What yes. happened in case of an encrypted file system? Uh, if it was uh, encrypted, uh, it would be, could be much difficult to, to start the process. Maybe you have to use the JTAG interface and uh, uh, try to download the firmware once it has been loaded and uh, un unencrypted. On the, on, the, on the flash memory. Or you can uh, try to understand uh, in some way to using maybe the, also the JDAG interface to, to debug the, the system at the early stage of the decrypting phase. Because to decrypt, you have to, for sure, the router has the decrypting key. Um, but uh, uh, there are a lot of issues also for the manufacturer because if they ship an encrypted firmware, they have to be sure that on their router is already loaded the decrypting key. Uh, so sometimes, because often you can restart from, from scratch, also without the router, without the firmware, maybe it can be difficult that the supplier will ship an encrypted, uh, an encrypted version. So the supplier have to put additional equipment or attention to manage this situation. So often, at least in consumer-grade products, Rarely you will find uh, encrypted firmware, but it's possible maybe in uh, commercial uh, applications. Other questions? Anybody? No?
Yeah, I'd like to know if uh, it ever happened that uh, you, uh, don't know, bricked some device or even worse, uh, and did some damage to your uh, uh, laptop or oh, equipment uh, because of some wrong assumptions. This can happen. This can happen. In fact, if to do this project, I received my router on May this year. But first thing that I did, I bought another device identical on eBay <laughs> because <laughs> I wanted to to, uh, to not risk to interrupt the internet connection also for the rest of the family. So uh, this can happen. Also, often it happens. So you open this router, you analyze all his uh, functionalities, and you, uh, you showed us how to modify the firmware. But what did you really do? Like testing of stuff out, or just analyzing all the, the router? Basically, I did uh, what I said. I started analyzing the, f the file system, the extracted the file system with the walk, analyzing the router looking at these components, uh, executing binaries in the emulation, emulated environment, and trying to, found, to find a lot of information, especially reading, uh, uh, analyzing the file system, so reading the shell script and so on. This was the most uh, time-consuming part. Also because my initial idea was to be able, uh, to, be able to modify the firmware without uh, not so much trouble instead it was much more difficult because of the signature. Okay. So thank you, Valerio. Oh, thank you very much. For, uh, thank you.